What is that you're hiding under your cloak, boy? Nothing, Lord. This is a Spartan story from the ancient days that we'll get into at the end of this episode. This is the agoge, the education of a Spartan boy. Now at age seven, Spartan boys were taken away from their parents and enrolled in the upbringing, the agoge, which lasted from age seven to age 18, at which point they became an adult and a warrior and, and a full participant in society. And people have wondered, the Spartans were so secretive, they wrote nothing down and they kept everything as close to the vest as they could that we only have kind of bits and pieces of what this training really was about. Um, one of the things we know is that the boys were fed starvation rations. Um, they were encouraged to steal. And the reason for that was that uh, they, they, they felt that the, the Spartans felt that on campaign in the war, sometimes you had to forage, you had to go here and there to get something to eat. And so stealing was encouraged. Now what the crime was, was it was getting caught. And the boys, if you got caught stealing, you got whipped so severely that there are many stories of Spartan boys that kind of endured this in silence to the point of death. So it was a pretty intense situation here. Uh, the boys were given one coarse cloth cloak that they wore all year long, nothing under it. They um, slept on the porticos of the public buildings in their little groups, in their kind of tribes. And for mattresses, they used reeds that they had to pull by hand out of the Eurotas River. They were not allowed to cut them. They trained in um, military events. They did close order drill. But like this field here, this is Will Rogers Park, the polo field. But it's probably, ancient Sparta probably looked a lot like this. There were games, there were contests, there were all kinds of athletic things. Ball games, we don't know what kind. I, I wish we did. There was one race in the Agoge that was barefoot, cross country, and the idea of the race was each boy had to take a mouthful of water at the start and they weren't allowed to swallow it for the whole race. I don't know how long it was, a mile, 10 miles, something like that. And if you swallowed it, you were disqualified. When you got to the end, you had to spit out that water and that was how the winner was determined. Going back to that first quote at the start of the story, this, is, this comes from Plutarch. And it's kind of a weird story, but whether it's apocryphal or not, I don't know. But supposedly, a Spartan boy had stolen a fox cub and had hidden it underneath his cloak. And a couple of, of grown Spartans came and they were allowed to interrogate these boys at any time uh, on any subject, on discipline, on honor, or whatever. And they had no idea that the boy had this cub underneath his cloak. And the boys, when they, when they were interrogated, they had to stand with their, with their hands under the cloak with their eyes down, not looking at the, the adults who were interrogating. So anyway, they, they, this went on, the interrogation, what is honor, what is the best man in the city, that kind of thing like that. And while this was happening, the cub underneath the cloak started biting and gnawing into the, the young boy's belly. And the story goes that he endured this without making a sound until he finally fell and died and bled out from that thing. And Plutarch was alive. He was, oh, by the way, I made a mistake in an earlier uh, episode here. I said that Plutarch was a Roman. He actually was a Boeotian Greek, so I apologize for that. But he, Plutarch uh, was alive in the first century AD which was 400, 500 years after the Spartans' prime heyday. So the culture had, had really declined a long, long way and actually had been revived a few times. And one of the things during one of these revivals was they used to do the ritual whippings of the boys in front of the temple of Artemis Orthia and tourists would come to watch these things. And Plutarch reports that he saw many boys beaten to the point of death at this thing, so take that for whatever it's worth. Um, but one last thing I want to talk about here is kind of is our contemporary Spartans. You know, we have a lot of people these days, and I include myself among them, who are runners, are gym people, Spartan race, tough mutter, CrossFit, you know, marathons, ultra marathons, all that kind of stuff. And I kind of wonder, or people wonder, I'm sure, why do people adopt this lifestyle when they could 
have a life of ease. Why, what are they training for? They're not really training for war. And they're also doing it different from the Spartans in the sense that they're doing it, men and women today, voluntarily. If you were Spartan, you had no choice, you had to do it. And also the men and women who are doing this today are doing it as individuals. That's not a group, it's not a, you know, they, maybe there's a group when they train together, but they're coming to it as individuals. And sometimes you might wonder why, there's, what are we training for? What is this all about? And I think it's, it's a moral choice. I think it's a life choice. I think that uh, we are, or people who are doing this, are imitating the training of these kind of ancients and, and others that people admire and are deliberately choosing a life of adversity, a life of effort, a life of strain, and deliberately turning their backs on a life of ease. And because they believe that this is a better way to live their life. I know I do. When I start the morning with something hard and something physical, and I can say to myself, nothing else in my day is gonna be as hard as what I just did, I've got a real head start on my day. And I think that's why our modern Spartans are doing that too. They're going back in their own way to the training from the old days, from the ancient days, from the agoge, the upbringing. Mm -hmm.